Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Interlinked, the official Neo Tokyo podcast powered by Shrapnel. Brace for impact, gamers, and prepare yourself for the sacrifice zone with Shrapnel. The world's first moddable triple A extraction based shooter built by a legendary award winning team behind some of your favorite games like Call of Duty and Halo. And they are kicking off 2024 with an absolute banger. People are finally going to be able to get their hands on shrapnel during their early access season. And they are giving away $3 million worth of prizes. So buckle your chin straps and get ready to dive in and try and get your piece of the prize. Huge shout out to our sponsor, Playable Games. They are inspired by gamers and funded by their community. They have a Epic game on the Epic Game Store, a third-person shooter called Nexus. Hop on in there and check that out. They're also currently selling nodes, so if you're interested, check that out at their website, playable.games. That is a three instead of a B on playable. Now strap in for the rest of this episode of Interlinked. Today, we have the honor of speaking with Mr. Dan the founder and CEO of Cytus. Dan, welcome. Super excited to have you alongside my uh, legendary co-host, Nick. Um, so glad we get a chance to chat. Would love to just learn more about you, get an intro from you, and, and uh, begin the deep dive into Cytus. Sure. Um, thanks for having me today, guys. It, it is a privilege. Um, love your project. Love the ecosystem. It's doing extremely well. So well done to you guys. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm the CEO of Cytus Heroes. Um, uh, it's a game publisher um, slash the gaming metaverse that combines a whole bunch of different games within one lore book and the entire architecture that connects them all together. Um, we've been doing it for a while already. Uh, we are one of the first projects among with Alluvium and a whole bunch of others who started back in 2022. Um, and since that time, we are constantly building dedicating all of our time to uh, build something innovative and you know um, i would say a game changer in the in the gaming space because uh, nobody has ever connected different games within one lore book and allowed people to transport their prog progress from one game into the other yeah uh would love to just kind of hear like how did the had the project come about like who else is on the team like let's let's go into the deep dive we want to hear the whole story Sure. Um, so um, our project is made of uh, over 150 specialists. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty extensive team. Um, or many of them are based in Abu Dhabi in Dubai. There are quite a few uh, living in Thailand. Uh, we actually have a, a like a local village, Cider's Village, living there and working along with the local government because uh, there are so many of us. Um, there are quite a few people living in Australia. So it's, it's a very international team. Um, um, the initial idea was to build a, a metaverse with an MMORPG world, but uh, we've slightly changed the concept eventually, um, trying to make separate games with the um, uh, same story. Like, I wouldn't say same storyline, but think of us as the Star Wars in a way, right? So you have a whole world that um, connects different storylines between them. Like you, you all watched Mandalorian, Andor, Obi-Wan, a whole bunch of different storylines from um, uh, the production studio. And uh, all of them have different storylines. All of them have different backgrounds and they all come from different planets and locations and within the Star Wars world, right? The same for us. So where we have Sidus Heroes as the, uh, Sidus is the world. Uh, the translation is um, uh, from Latin. It, 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 it translates as the star. Um, and um, it's like a whole world that um, has a bunch of games, uh, different types of games. We have um, real-time strategy game. We have third-person browser shooter. We have hyper-casual gaming. Uh, we have uh, uh, social deduction game that is coming up. Uh, a whole bunch of different ones. Butler, three versus three. So, um, but they're all sharing the same world, kind of like Star Wars, right? Um, and the world we have, uh, it's uh, it's all based on the books that we've recently published on Amazon. So you can actually go to your Google, uh, type in Sadu's book, and you'll see uh, that there is a, a series of books released by um, Sadu's Gates publisher. Um, and these books basically describe the world of Sadu's. It's like you read basically Avatar style book uh, or a Star Wars style book or, you know, a whole bunch of futuristic sci-fi 
uh, games that you potentially played or watched before as movies. Um, and the storylines are pretty unique and the whole concept in terms of the lore book is very unique as well. So eventually we aim to have a, a series of TV shows or maybe even a movie if we have a successful deal with the uh, platforms like HBO or Netflix, etc. But um, our idea and objective is to create a culture, not just a single game, but a series of games that people will love to play and they will never get tired because... Um, the idea is to create a constant experience, like an entertainment experience that allows you um, to transport your character with the entire progress attached to it. And I mean like your levels, your um, gear, your items, artifacts, anything you have within your inventory and bring it into the other game and continue on. So you you know, you play a racing game, you, you get sick of it within six months and there is a life spin of every game as we all need, uh, as we all know. Every game has a live spin. Um, once you get sick of it, you just um, take your character and you go and uh, continue on with another game. So, right? so uh, it kind of creates that constant uh, um, experience flow for, for a gamer. Um, and uh, they are literally staying within one ecosystem uh, of Cydus. Uh, it is a big challenge. It's not a, an easy task, to be honest with you, because... Um, I mean, um, nobody has ever connected different games between each other um, because there is a high risk and the probability of you failing as uh, one game has uh, one economy behind it and the infrastructure, the other game has another economy. And the question is, how do you make an economy so universal that it doesn't ruin the experience of players from one game into the other, especially if you bring a level 80 character from racing game into a RPG Um uh, game and uh, it doesn't ruin the experience of other players that are actually playing these games. So there are a lot of things and tricky, tricky technological issues that we have to solve as a company. But um, I mean, it's all going well. Like it takes time. It's not a quick process, but we'll get there. Uh, it's it's a big project for sure. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah. Would love to kind of dive deeper into this concept of lore, and you're basically you're basically world building. Um, similar to, um, you know, like, like you were saying, Star Wars, in my mind, that gives you guys the perspective or the advantage or the ability to be more than just a game. You're, you're an entire world, an entire ecosystem, an entire universe. Can you kind of talk through a little bit more about how did you build that from the ground up? How did you think about that? And then what some of the logistics around that include and and then you know maybe just kind of do a do a deeper dive double triple click down on um on that idea yeah well um the whole idea came um um as a as a, as a massive brainstorm um, between all of our um executives um, and the co-founders like we've been brainstorming a lot of different ideas a lot of different concepts and um you know as a part of our team um teamwork we all cooperate not just with artists but we also work with uh, 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 quite quite a well-known famous uh, authors uh, that um, actually worked with the sci-fi industry before people have actually worked with uh, movie production before in terms of the futuristic worlds and um, we always been uh, excited about the idea of building something that shares a uh, kind of concept of uh, star citizen that, that well, what they're building now is costing them hundreds of millions of dollars obviously we don't have that much budget as they, as they do but uh, what we are pretty strong at is that you know our previous experience and uh, our game producers background as well is coming from uh, you know building um, the sci-fi strategies and um, futuristic worlds like rpg worlds um, uh, related to the star wars uh, environment in a way so um he um he was always passionate about this um um fantasy sci-fi uh, futurism and uh, he uh, know knew quite a lot of uh, authors from that um, space so uh, we decided to work with uh, uh, a guy from us uh, his name is daniel subralinov he's um he's kazakh based he's from kazakhstan originally but he's living in the us for quite a long time and he he wrote a series of books called Disguardium. Um, Disguardium got um, pretty um, successful. Uh, I would say well, very, very successful. Like he sold hundreds and thousands of copies. And uh, I think there are eight books released um, uh, on Amazon. Um, and uh, 
it, it did so well that he got inspired to write a, a new series of books and he met us, right? So we uh, had a couple of conversations and uh, he decided to work with us because he got inspired by uh, the idea of uh, connecting uh, books with the actual uh, execution process of building the game itself. So uh, we uh, we uh, we had this inspiration, which we've shared from both sides. Um, and uh, that's basically how it started, really. Uh, we uh, had quite a few ideas about the main characters, um, the locations of our world as well. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Sidus Heroes has a central location called uh, Needham Station. And Needham Station is like a... Uh, center of the universe uh, where only the most advanced races and civilizations of uh, the space we were able to uh, together so like in order for you for you to get to that location you were uh, you as a civilization or a race have uh, have to um, have to be able to uh, have a uh, a sufficient technological progress to build uh, very sophisticated engines um for your spaceships to um, to get to that location, and not every race is able to do that, right? So, um, and uh, the races that you meet at this station is uh, uh, they are quite uh, advanced when it comes to the technology, and they're all coming from different locations. We have uh, a race of Ogia coming from the planet of fire. We have a race of uh, um, Reptorians coming from the planet of swamps. Uh, we have Xanians. Uh, it's a female race controlling. Uh, um, robotic machinery using AI technology on their planet because it's it's all um, it's all covered in sand like dune style um, but there are have managed to build a series of robots that are um, able to um, uh, mine some special resources from this planet to uh, be able to uh, build a certain infrastructure on the, the other planets um, including asteroids and Things like that. It's all in the book. Um, <laughs> it's going to take me ages to describe the entire concept, but uh, I think I think the the space theme is such a such a huge topic, and uh, everyone has its own personal view on things, right? So, I mean, we all watch the movies like Halo, right, coming from the actual game, and it has its personal view on the on the costumes, on the characters, on the on the environment itself, uh, flora and fauna, right? So, um, you know, it's just, it's it's an endless experience that you can execute within uh, a game and people will love it because there will be always fans for your particular environment. Um, someone loves Star Wars, someone loves Halo, someone loves Avatar, and uh, someone loves Sidious. I'm sure someone loves uh, a whole bunch of other games within that free space. I, I mean, there are a lot of them, Star Atlas, Shrapnel, et cetera, right? So, um, people uh, people enjoy the the diversity, and this is what uh, the Vapri is all about. You know, to uh, create this diversity of games and um, technologies that we can offer to our gamers. Um, so, the other thing that differentiates Sidus from, um, um, I would say, space theme games within the the Vapri industry is that uh, we are all about um, as um, kind of like this um, spreading the um the control among the actual players so we are not big fans of centralization we like the idea of decentralization and uh, we think that uh the power of the game should belong to the gamers to the actual players instead of the team and uh we've created a pretty unique technology that uh, i've never seen in any other game out there um, it's called the module economy and uh, what makes it unique is that Imagine you go to your local shopping center um, and you're walking and you see a whole bunch of different shops. Like you see Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Starbucks, your local store, food store. And uh, let's say you like Louis Vuitton shop that um, is a part of your um, shopping center. So you're walking and you say, you, you try to find the manager or the owner of this business. You come to him or her and you say, listen, I, I like your business. I really want to become a co-owner. I like, really want to help you to grow. Um, or she or he, they're saying, oh, yeah, I know you guys, like, I know you personally, you're a, a, a nice guy, you can definitely bring me value. I think I can sell you 5% of my business for, let's say, I don't know, 1,000 tons of potatoes or bananas, right? <laughs> um, but it's your task to go and search for these bananas, right? So you go out there and you search for these 1,000 tons of bananas, you come back and you say, yep, I've got 1,000 tons of bananas, and you get your 5% royalty or a 5% 
um, ownership of that business. The same idea we've applied to our our games, basically. So every game, it's divided into the modules or little businesses. Marketplace is a business. Um, online store is a business. Um, reproduction facility where you can create clones of your main characters to do some um, secondary job is a business. Spaceship uh, factory where you can produce your spaceships is a business as well. So what we've done is we allow people who play our games to own these businesses. And how do you do that? Well, you let people earn inside of the games, not just tokens, like you see many other games out there, play and earn, but you actually earn not just tokens, you get um, resources from different planets. So you go to one planet, you get crystals. You go to the other planet, you get some special composite materials. You go to the other planet and you get some special fruit that you can only get in this particular planet. And then what happens is you when you when you go to the central station, that's where you can become a co-owner of the business. You press modules, and there is a list of different businesses that you can invest into. You can only invest into the businesses that haven't been uh, launched as yet. So there is a status for every business, completed or production phase or in the collection phase. And if it says in the collection phase, when you press it, there is a list of resources that you can contribute. And if you do contribute it, you get a percentage of ownership in exchange for that business. And that percentage gives you every single transaction a profit that goes to your MetaMask wallet, right? So if someone comes to a, a marketplace and they buy something there, there is a GST or we call it you know, tax fee. Let's say it's 5%. So um, let's say someone spends $1 million on the marketplace, we charge 5%, which which is equal to $50,000. And these $50,000 are divided into the royalties to the co-owners of, co of this business. So it creates a strong incentive for players to um, contribute to the economics of uh, economy of uh, games um, overall. And it gives them a strong incentive to bring more players as well because they are feeling a part of the actual game instead of just being the gamers. Um, and uh, it really changes the experience, I'll be honest with you, because we don't give any privileges to the co-founders or a team. Everyone is equal. Literally, everyone is equal. It doesn't matter if you're a whale or if you're just a, a smaller player. Uh, there is a limit every single day that you can contribute. So we are having a special anti-whale system that doesn't allow you as a whale to control the entire operations of um businesses within our games if, if you know what i mean that's very important to be honest because um, we don't want to ruin the experience of players and want to make sure everyone is equal with their rights um i think the other factor that makes us interesting is that we build games that are quite innovative um, in terms of its gameplay core gameplay um few things uh, the first thing is that we use innovative technologies. We build games in Telegram. We'll build games in browser. So we don't just use Unreal Engine 5 like many other companies do because there is a, 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 bit, a bit of a risk. When you use Unreal Engine 5, you automatically compete with the giants in this industry. And I'm talking about Activision, Blizzard, Ubisoft, Wargaming, Playrix, etc., etc., etc. The whole bunch of other guys, right? Tencent. And these guys can spend billions of dollars on marketing uh, for these massive games on the devices like Xbox, PlayStation, uh, Nintendo, etc. So it, it is a competition that you have to overcome. And it's not easy. I mean, what are the chances for you to do extremely well in the Unreal Engine 5 space? When you go to your PlayStation store, how many actual games you skip until you find the game you want to play, right? I always ask that question. People skip hundreds of games. There could be some good games out there. But because they haven't done any marketing, you don't know them. And you just don't want to play them, really. Even if the price is $5 or $10, you're searching for Diablo 4 and it's going to cost you $129, right? So there are a lot of questions in the Unreal Engine 5. That's why we decided not to go to this way. We decided to uh, build games which are more accessible. Because this is where the mass market is. Uh, if you go to uh, countries like Myanmar, if you go to countries like Cambodia, Nigeria, Kenya, Malaysia, or Philippines, the interesting part is that 
these people don't even have PlayStations or they don't have the Xboxes, they don't have Nintendos. The average device in these countries is an Android with one gig of RAM and 300 KB per second internet. That's all they have. So the question is, would they be uh, able to download a game like Black Desert with 120 gigs of data on their PC when they have an internet speed of 300 KB per second? No way, literally no way. But they all play simple games. They all play hyper casual games. They play Temple Runner. I'm sure you all play Temple Runner, right? Simple concept, super simple, right? But how many downloads this game has? Half a billion downloads, right? So they're making more money out of ads than some Unreal Engine 5 production companies out there, right? You look at games like um, Snake, simple Snake browser game. This game is selling more skins for their snakes than Assassin's Creed's all series of Assassin's Creed's combined selling within the store for the skins of their characters, et cetera. So they're making a lot of money, right? Angry Birds, the same, a simple game, nothing too special, Fruit Ninja. So um, sometimes in the gaming space, you just have to bring something interesting in terms of the, the gameplay core. And we're trying to play with different different, um, different innovations. So we try to bring games that are interesting and highly accessible. So we build games for those countries that I've mentioned that you can access from Telegram, from browser, or from your app store or Google store, um, Android store. Um, Telegram is a big thing as well because I'm a big believer in Telegram. Many people underestimate the power of Telegram. The Telegram has 700 million users and it makes it a perfect distribution platform for gaming, right? So there are a couple of companies that actually do it, us and Nakamoto Games as well. So we, we build in Telegram. Nakamoto b- builds simple games, but they're doing extremely well. We build a little bit more sophisticated games. So we specialize in quality over quantity. So we, we take a little bit more time, but the games we launch are 3D and very high quality, right? So we're just about to announce very big partnership between us and a, a luxury brand, um, a very famous luxury brand um, uh, that uh, plans to work with us in terms of the gaming um, exposure. So they really want to get into the gaming. And uh, what they're going to do is they are providing us with the prizes worth more than half a million dollars. So we're going to um, give away three items every single month within the game that we're about to launch that you can win if you are getting to a top 100 or to, to top 200 in the game. Um, and these items, uh, every of these items is worth more than $20,000. So if you um, if you win an item, uh, it's, it's going to be sent to your mailbox just as a package and you'll get your price. Um, so uh, pretty cool, actually. Uh, we've never tried it before, but if it goes well, we will uh, scale it up substantially. Uh, it's a big business, so I'm sure you will hear a lot about it very soon. Uh, but it, it's just an interesting approach to mix physical prices with the gaming uh, in the web free space in Telegram as well. So it will all be in Telegram. Um, so, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, um, we've launched, uh, uh, last year we've launched the game. Uh, it's a, a real-time battle royale strategy. Uh, I mean, it sounds pretty cool already. Uh, you combine battle royale with a real-time strategy. Not many games have ever done it before. You can see a lot of RTS games, real-time strategies, but not many RTS games combine battle royale mode. So we've done it. And um, it's already on the App Store. You can type in Xena. X E double N A Xena. You you can uh, you can go and download it yourself and give it a try. Uh, the game is up and running. Uh, it works with a whole bunch of different uh, payment solutions like Visa, Mastercard, Union Pay, etc. So people can actually purchase stuff inside of this game. But it's also connected to the web free. So you can uh, win some uh, prizes that you can claim on the Cytus Heroes uh, website and uh, use it in the other games as well that are coming up. So um, Pretty exciting. I mean, there are a lot of things happening in the pipeline, which I cannot disclose, but 2024 will be quite hot is we're preparing a lot of updates and some big releases that will be uh, quite exciting for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I'm talking a lot. 
<laughs> no, no, we, uh, that's the whole reason we really found that there's a niche for the long form podcast, because in our sort of like hyper short content world, it's, it's nice to have a venue where you can dive into the details here. Uh, so you already touched upon, uh, the RTS game, the future, the telegram game, I think it would be a good place just to continue the foundation for the audience. What are the other game offerings currently available in the Cytus universe? And then we can use that as a launch point to maybe explore that really well thought out economic portion inside one of those games to really drive home for the audience. Well, I mean, it's a matter of personal choices, right? Um, everyone has its personal taste. Um, we currently have, as I said, our RTS Battle Royale, which is called Xena. We have um, uh, uh, Needum. Uh, Needum is our butler, uh, which is available br in browser. Um, so if you go to a CytusHeroes.com website, um, you will be able to choose the game you want to play. Some games are accessible from browser straight away. You don't even need to download anything. Some games you need to download to your mobile phone. Um, so Xena is a mobile game that you can download, but it's also a PC game and it's also Mac-based game. So you can play from any device you want. Um, uh, Needham is a browser-based game. So you can play it from your PC, not from a mobile phone, but from the PC because it's a little bit more sophisticated from this technological point of view. There is another game called Tambazar. Tambazar, it's a planet uh, populated by cyborgs, uh, bloody busters that are killing each other for a single purpose, to uh, get as many artifacts from each other as possible. So if you kill another cyborg, you will be able to get some special parts that you can put on your body and become much more powerful. Um, it's a third person browser shooter. Um, so it's not a first person, but a third person browser shooter. Um, all in browser as well. So um, you uh, you just go to a cytoseries.com website um, and uh, you choose Dambazar and just press play and you'll, you'll get into it straight away. Pretty exciting, cool graphics, all in browser, accessible for anyone around the world. Um, we also have, um, so Nidum, Tambazar, uh, Gazeta. Uh, we, we have um, uh, um, Astorali, which is a Telegram-based game. We've just stopped it because it was a seasonal game. We don't want to make it boring. Uh, so what we do in Telegram is we'll launch the game for a couple of months, then we stop it, then we'll launch the new game. Right, so the previous game was called Astro Rally. There will be a new game coming up very soon. Um, if you're a big fan of Among Us, I'm sure many people loved Among Us before. Uh, we have a game called Falconium, which is a, a social deduction game um, with the poker betting system inside of it. So you can actually bet on your favorite players using uh, video streaming technology. So inside of this social deduction game, we've applied two different innovations. Poker betting, which is fully legal. It's not a casino. It's not a gambling. It's more of a poker strategical thinking. Um, and uh, video streaming. It's like Zoom inside of a social deduction. We all remember Among Us. It was all in chat. So you, you have to text each other and talk each other via the chat. So we've simplified the conversations. We've made it um, able for people to talk via the camera and uh, make uh, uh, decisions. Who is the mafia? Who is uh, uh, just a normal citizen, etc.? So that's a pretty exciting game that is coming up. Uh, a new series of games coming as a joint venture with the luxury brand. Those games will be hyper casual, but they will be cool because there will be a series of different characters branded to this particular brand that you will see. Um, this is a big brand. We're talking about some serious, uh, serious business. Uh, I can't really tell you the name, but think of the level of Louis Vuitton, you know, Gucci, uh, Rolex. That's the level of these companies. So, um, once again, if uh, this experiment goes well, then we have a, a pipeline of business partners who actually want to work with us So um, um, to uh, experiment within the gaming space. So we're definitely looking forward to share more updates about that part as well. Um, and there'll be quite a few other games coming up very soon. Um, we're uh, still in the sort of production phase, as I said. Uh, we, we cannot disclose too many things, but uh, you can choose it all on the website. We have a lot of uh, different DeFi digging uh, features. You can have staking, you can have farming pools. It's all on the website. We have plenty of different bridges that you can use. We're exclusive business partners with Linea. Linea is the ZK EVM, layer two ZK EVM. Uh, we work with Linea in a whole bunch of different places. We just recently went to Manila to YGG conference to work there and uh, present Linea and uh, Cytus uh, together. Um, yeah, there are a lot of happening. Uh, a lot of things happening within the 
the space and uh, hopefully the market will uh, turn positive again, right? <laughs> I mean, there is a bit of a dump, but I mean, it's a short term. Things just, you know, it works a cycle, so we don't mind. So good. perfect timing to build. Yeah, it's. I think it's really interesting too how you guys are taking so many different shots on goal all at the same time. Like you have the the browser, you have the Telegram, you have the mobile, and then you're going for all the different types of game styles. Um, I think it, it might be interesting to maybe kind of talk a little bit about when you have such a large operation with so many different, I guess, silos or pillars of everything. Like, how do you keep it all organized? How do you make sure that, you know, quality is top notch for you guys? So how do you make sure that the quality is still there while still taking so many shots on goal? Um, and then after that, would love to kind of move into the to the Web3 side of the ecosystem and talk a little bit more about the different assets and uh, do a deep dive there. Yeah, quality is a, is a big part. It's a, it's a pain in the ass. Like, I mean, we all try to achieve, uh, you know, a perfect um, outcome, but uh, it, it always comes with certain obstacles on its way. So um, when you build something in browser or build something in Telegram, uh, it comes with its own challenges. Um, sometimes you have to sacrifice certain graphics or quality for more of a uh, addictive gameplay. Um, there are quite a few examples actually recently I saw uh, in the Minecraft space, right? So Minecraft is big, uh, Roblox or Roblox uh, is massive as well. Uh, but some some uh, small game studios, what they've done is they took a certain concept of Minecraft and they've sacrificed quality for gameplay, and they just went wild because people loved simplicity, but they all loved that ability to have. 126 people from one side and 126 people from the other side just to you know fight each other kill each other shoot each other as much as they can with no limitations um so you know we've seen quite a few uh recent uh projects that did extremely well just copy pasting minecraft and sacrificing quality the same for us we try to achieve quality in in every single aspect but uh because we are first-time explorers in the browser space and Telegram space, there is no guide that tells us how to build a perfect game in Telegram or how to build a perfect game in browser. I'm sure if you build it in, in Unreal Engine 5, I always say that if you make an ugly tree, you just press adjust and it makes a justification a justification for you. You can make a beautiful tree for you or you can just use a draft prepared for you but if you do it in browser in in the technologies like babylon or play canvas there is no such thing it stays ugly trick <laughs> so you you really need to make it perfect and uh, to make it perfect you have to have a, a very knowledgeable and professional um, team members to uh, make it happen so we have uh, team members coming from disney studio we have team members coming from some other well-known game studios before and the uh, movie production studios in general um so we we really we really pay attention to uh, quality comes was as i said with its own challenges so we've been working um from home style on distance style for a long long time like more than seven years already before even COVID kicked in so we kind of knew how to um uh, track the KPI of all of our employees and team members. So uh, we were knowledgeable enough to uh, uh, check the uh, execution and the quality there. So we were okay with that part. But technologically speaking, it is a bloody challenge. Don't get me wrong. It is a massive challenge. Like And uh, uh, yeah, quality is, um, is still not something that we have to, uh, we can apply as yet. Um, it's getting there. It's getting, it will definitely get there. But um, as I said, it's going to take time. Um, we obviously have a, a multi-level of checks. Um, so we have a game producer that looks after the quality. That's his main job. Um, we have um, uh, uh, team leaders who are obviously responsible for the quality of the feature that uh, they are delivering. We have um, testers, people who test the feature or the particular product about that we're about to release. So there are a lot of different levels of checks we do. But once again, and my community can say even more about it. When we release something, something comes up all the time <laughs> and they blame us for not checking it and stuff, but we've actually checked it. It's just when you release it on browser, uh, there are a lot of things happening, uh, a lot of surprises. So <laughs> yeah, we do the best we can really. Yeah. 
Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And then I think we can uh, take some of our remaining time to go and talk a little bit about the um, the assets and the ecosystem. Um, and I would actually love to learn a little bit more about um, like even how the Web two stuff fits in, like with the the Amazon published um, you know information. I'll call that like an uh, an info product um, across the the gambit of then you have your Web three assets, um, you have your uh, different tokens, um, and then yeah, maybe you could just kind of give us a breakdown of like what all does exist and then how they all fit together and and come together and integrate. Well. First, th- first thing to say is we have to create an incentive for people to go around different games, right? So we don't want people who have uh, a single game experience. They, they all go to Xena and just play Xena and they forget about Tembazar and Needham and a whole bunch of other games. There is always an incentive for them to go back to other game. And these incentives are assets, right? Assets are very valuable. You cannot upgrade a particular weapon, for example, if you do not have a particular resource or asset that you can only get from that particular game or a planet, let's call it a planet, right? So we have different planets. Um, so if you want to upgrade your weapon or an armor, you have to go to Tambazar, for example, and get this blue crystal, right? If you want to get and, and uh, upgrade uh, your navigation system on your spaceship, you have to go and play Xena, which also gives you these assets that you can only get on Xena, right? So there are two different scenarios for you as a gamer or a player. You can go and buy it, on the marketplace as an NFT, um, but you will buy it from the player. Players that actually go and play games, right? So I went to play Xena, I win this particular asset, then I go to the marketplace and guess what? I will price it. My timing will be priced into this particular item. So I'm not gonna sell it for $1, I'm gonna sell it for $20, for example, right? Um, and uh, people need to pay premium to get these particular assets if they don't wanna dedicate their time and play this game. Or on the other hand, you can go and play Xena and win some assets, right? And you can uh, you can get it for free if you play the game, if you win the other players as well. So that creates a circulation of items between sellers and buyers and people who don't want to play and people who actually want to play. It's a constant supply and demand, right? That's the first thing. Uh, assets are divided into different categories. We have uh, special unique assets that you can only get once and no more or you can get it as many as you want, right? Some special resources, as I said before, that you can invest into the modules, you can get them as much as you want, right? You can go and play Butler and you can get some uh, crystals, composite materials, aluminum, wood, gold, silver, ingot, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you get these resources in different quantities and uh, you go and spend it um, to get a royalty in the in the particular business you wanna you wanna use. Uh, or you can use these resources for other purposes um, to improve your, um, uh, improve, as I said, your spaceship, um, uh, uh, allocate some tasks to your replicants, uh, or build a new replicant uh, within your um, within your uh, particular business model. You can use these resources in the labor market, so you can actually hire people to do some job for you and pay them money. Um, we have an organizational module, or call it scholarship module where you can hire people, uh, you can lease stuff to these people, and you can make money out of it as well. So there is a, a labor market which is heavily involved within our ecosystem. It's all in browser, by the way, so you don't need to download anything. It's You, you go to the website and you do it. Uh, simple. Um, there are a lot of different things. Um, we haven't launched many use cases as yet, but there are already hundreds of different use cases you can use your resources for. But there will be many, many more. There will be many, many more. It's not an open world as yet. Once we actually launch an open world for Cytus Heroes, you will be finally be able to build your spaceships and start improving your um, uh, uh, your facilities within the spaceship, right? You can start building certain features and things like that. You can uh, improve your um, improve, improve your properties in different planets as well. We will have a political system, which is also that 3 based. Uh, political system is... Um, is designed around allowing people to conduct elections within our metaverse. What it means is that once a month, you can elect um, a number of senators in the Senate uh, using blockchain elections, or you can elect the president that will actually rule the, the rule a particular planet uh, for a certain period of time. 
that creates that competition between the guilds because the only uh, the only uh, organization that can actually apply for these elections will be the guild. So the guild will go and register a political fraction on the blockchain. Let's call it. Let's let's say you go and register um, uh, a Democratic Party in the side of heroes, and I go and uh, register Republicans, right? And uh, we have elections. So uh, for two days, for 48 hours, every single month, there will be elections happening. And there will be a massive competition between different guilds. People will be voting for their favorite leader. So one leader will become the president of the entire Needham station. And the other leaders will become the senators. Uh, you as a president, you have a lot of power that you can do. You can uh, build, uh, 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 for example, uh, orbital stations to take over um, unpopulated planets that haven't been even explored before. And you can uh, kill the local inhabitants and use the resources of this planet to explore, expand your um, expand your empire in a way, right? But if uh, senators don't like your decision, they can place the veto using blockchain as well, if they have a consensus. So there are a lot of tricky things that we actually use from that three, which makes it super interesting because people love politics. If you're an adult, you love politics. You love to be the leader of the race. You love to be the leader of the guild. You have that responsibility. You manage people. But in exchange, you get that dedication and loyalty for players as well, right? So, um, I mean, I've um, I've been playing EVE Online for quite a long time. I know a lot of people from EVE Online. EVE Online is massive when it comes to fractions. People are, you know, making huge guilds and they're fighting against each other and stuff like that. So it's a pretty cool concept. So things like that, we, we, we do it and it's going to come along very soon. Yeah, I love the level of intricacy. I mean, who doesn't love a deep universe if that's the one that you're exploring? Um, one particular thing that uh, um, could provide or could create a challenge I'd imagine from managing such an in-depth system with so many spinning plates, and maybe this applies to both lore and economics, but when you've got multiple games, multiple facets, I imagine multiple teams, how do you manage from you know a top level not having you know resources become too inflationary resources from this game you know creating a problem in one of the other games and then from a lore standpoint i mean we've seen even projects as successful as star wars accidentally paint themselves into a corner from a lore standpoint because something happened on this planet when you know maybe they wanted that faction that was just destroyed to be relevant in a different story arc so i'd love to know from a management perspective how you keep these plates spinning and making sure they don't knock into each other create friction points um can you give me an example like i'm just so i, I get it straight into the point <laughs> instead of yeah. just trying to get it into the massive topic yeah, like let's say that there is a resource that's created in Xena that causes something inflationary inside of uh, Needham Arena, or from a story perspective, something happens in Tembazar that you know you wanted to use that race, like sort of the the checks and balances. We run into this even in Neo Tokyo when you have so many different teams. How do you create? Like you want to watch out for lore, you know, running into each other, creating a problem in an overall storyline. So from a management perspective, you know, how are you making sure that when you're spinning all these plates, they're not knocking into each other? The, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. That's actually a good question. I uh, always talk to a lot of different uh, ZKVMs and I always ask a question like, they always say, oh, well, why why the game cannot be just fully on-chain? The game cannot be fully on on-chain just because of that particular reason, right? So if something goes wrong, you're screwed up. <laughs> Simply uh, because you, you cannot control the emissions sometimes in certain things. I mean, you can create a certain number of items, but... If something goes wrong and someone takes a uh, an advantage of the weakness within the ecosystem, everything can go wrong. Like if someone goes to find the weakness within the a wood production facility and they cut the tree and instead of getting one item, they get one million pieces of woods and they take it and they ruin the entire marketplace, everything will go wrong. It will just follow. It's like an effect of domino. So um, that's why you have to have a partial decentralization. Uh, sorry, you have to have a partial centralization, right? So decentralized economy, yep, we let people trade, uh, get the royalties, invest into the businesses. You are more than welcome. But when it comes to the decisions of controlling the emission of certain resources and items, 
that's the part of the developers. That's where we have to control things before we even execute and give it to the public. So if something goes wrong, uh, we have a centralized control to stop the production of that particular item. So we have a, a, a multiple uh, um, uh, levels of security that will uh, stop the production straight away without pressing the red button um, because it, it's all based on the formulas. Um, so one item is it's rate, it has a ratio to the another item and it has a ratio to another item. So um, we follow the ratio formulas. Uh, if if the ratio goes wrong, the formula will go wrong. The whole process will get stopped automatically. Not all the processes are in the blockchain, by the way, as well. So, um, you know, there is an interaction between um, the front end, the back end, and the Web3 tech as well. So the Web3 only gets the final item before it's been checked three times within the back end and the front end as well, right? So there are a lot of different formulas that actually follow a particular number of productions and things like that. But as I said, this is a challenge, especially if you do it in browser, if you do it in Telegram, this is like a, a massive thing to do. Um, so uh, it, it is a very good question. And, uh, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, we're still looking for this perfect balance that would be ideal for all the games to have. But in order to control this, once again, you have to uh, really split uh, mining capabilities of every planet. So every planet has a limited number of resources that can only be mined in this particular space, a space or a spot. So, um, for example, you go to Tembazar, um, it has um, 5 million pieces of uh, uh, aluminium and no more. So you know exactly that this planet has 5 mil, that's it. Once it's exhausted, it's exhausted, right? So uh, they could find another uh, a resource there, but it will only be mined mineable if we decide to, right, uh, as a developer. Um, but yeah, we, we try to be very, very, um, very, very careful about how we go about the production of resources and things like that. Many companies can go really wrong. And if they do that, the whole, the whole thing will get ruined straight away. The token, everything will get damaged. So uh, very good question. Um, I'm, um, I'm in contact with a lot of on-chain uh, games that I speak to, but they have very simple process on 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 on-chain on games. They don't usually get into the sophistication. So if you look at the South Korean games, I'm, 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 have you played any South Korean games before, like RF Online or no? Have you had a chance? I haven't. To? No, no. So I don't think South so, Korean least. games are all about mathematics, all about numbers. These games are the most advanced and most sophisticated mathematically balanced games in the entire world. Nobody takes that approach in the gaming space. It's because it's so difficult and complex that if something goes wrong, the whole thing will get ruined. But South Koreans, they're actually doing a lot of experiments around these particular mathematical modules. So they do a lot of things. The, the, one of the most famous ones were RF Online, and they did extremely well with upgrading systems and different modifications and stuff. It's very, very complex within the back, uh, back end. Um, some games take a little, a little bit more of a simple approach, like Genshin Impact, right? So they're all about lore, but they're not really about uh, too much of a complication. But some games that you see on chain, they take a very, very careful approach. Skins on chain yeah i mean how many what what would be the risk of you to lose control over the skins not much really i mean you can just stop the production of skins um and they're slowly getting some resources not many not like hundreds like we do even thousands like we do maybe 10 to 20 resources that they can control very very carefully and if something goes wrong they can at least block it on the smart contract um that's why yeah, you don't really see many uh, on chain games that are all about thousands of resources and big risks. Um, the game that I really liked before was Alien Worlds, TLM token. Maybe you've heard about it on the BNB chain. Uh, simple game, nothing too special, but it was the biggest game in 2022 and 2023. Super simple. Um, yeah, but they did extremely well. Over 120,000 users and something like that. So pretty cool. So yeah. I want to I wanna do a... Um just a quick little shout out to you guys one because the complexity of your ecosystem must be a lot to manage and y'all are doing an amazing job um, but two you guys keep adding things and then also doing a good job with those um, i'm not sure if we're allowed to talk about this but i know you guys have your upcoming launch pad um, that you're building out of your ecosystem um, 
Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and then um, maybe how that ties in with the um, with the Senate and the CIDAS tokens. And um, yep. and then we can we can kind of get your perspective on the state of crypto gaming and, and then we'll probably be at about time then. Sounds good. Um, I mean, Launchpad is a is a natural outcome of our ecosystem. So um, we build a, a very extensive community, same as Neo Tokyo. We have a lot of users coming from uh, a whole bunch of different regions. Um, and um, because we are coming originally from the two space, gaming space, I mean, not myself, I'm more of a government background, but uh, all of my business partners are coming from game space. And uh, they have a lot of connections within this space. So they work with Sensent before they work with Wargaming, Playrix, and a whole bunch of other games. Um, they always get approached by these companies and they say, listen, uh, we have a, a series of game studios that we actually want to launch with the Web3 integration. So we really want to get into the Web3 space. Can you please help us? Okay. And um, the demand was so strong back in 2023 that we couldn't ignore it anymore. The, there is a strong demand for Web3 space and the Web3 knowledge from very, very professional game studios. If you look back in 2022, there are a lot of, um, unfortunately, there are a lot of scams, a lot of scams. People were just coming to this industry with beautiful video uh, videos of the games, uh, really, you know, exciting websites, but there were just no products. And they, they got, you know, they got smashed by the bearish market because of the lack of knowledge, lack of, uh, uh, skills to manage their resources and many other things as well. And let's be honest, bearish market was ideal storm to um, clear and filter the market from scams, right? So people who couldn't really manage things, they're all gone, right? So the ones that actually were able to manage risks and diversify them and uh, manage expectations and able to communicate to the community and get their support, they survived. So um, as a project that survived, and we're able to uh, manage uh, certain things and expectations and adjust the roadmap to uh, be able to uh, do to do well. Um, we realized that we can definitely bring a lot of value within the launchpad space. Um, so we want to bring some gems and um, projects that you won't see on the launchpads usually. The quality of these games that we're planning to work with will be something exceptional, to be honest, because... Um, once again, we get approached by very professional game studios, people who understand what game is and how to make it addictive. And they've already spent hundreds of millions of dollars before in different experiments. So at least they understand the behavior and the psychometrical um, uh, mindset of people in general in the gaming space. Um, it, it's very different from those uh, companies who come to this spare three space and they're willing to raise millions of dollars, but they have no idea how to manage this money and how to manage expectations. Um, this is a different story. So as a launchpad, our philosophy is very simple, quality over quantity, all right? Uh, we're not going to do tens of different IDOs per month. The maximum we'll do is maybe two IDOs per month. That's the maximum. But the quality of these IDOs will be very good. And uh, we will be managing them in different things. We will have a refundable system. We call it grace period. So if investors in the launch pad are not happy for the first week or so, they can get refunded. That's very important. Um, we will be managing the escrow accounts. So the project that is uh, doing the fundraising with us, they will be not getting 100% money straight away. They will be getting it from the escrow step by step, depending on their roadmap execution as well. That's very important. Uh, we will be uh, working with them in uh, in terms of the knowledge that we've been able, we've been able to obtain. So we will be able to share how to be um, as as much as as flexible as possible to uh, to uh, you know adjust your game model to. Um, you know, get the support from the web free space, from the web free community, because sometimes you come up with the perfect game, but people just don't want to play it in the web free space. People are slightly different from the classical gaming space. So we really need to um, manage their um, execution in general. And we'll be able to do that. So we have a, a strong team to do that. There will be a separate team 
managing the entire launch pad. So it's not like we will uh, uh, distract the main team from the execution of Cytus Heroes in general as a game project. No, uh, we're not going to do that. We are uh, we are managing and uh, we are teaching and training a special team that will be looking after the launch pad under our mentorship. So we will be mentors and we'll be the main, obviously, representatives, but um, it will be uh, all about quality. Um, we really want to make sure that projects that are getting listed they bring uh, some nice returns to uh, to uh, to those uh, launchpad participants. Um, launchpad will have a different tier system, so we have six different tiers. Um, tiers will be not so expensive. We don't want to make them too expensive. We are not big fans of whales. Like to be honest with you, whales are good, but it's a highly centralized control. If something goes wrong, they can easily dump tokens of the project and destroy it completely. We prefer to have uh, a mass market. Um, accessibility. So we want to make sure as many we have as many retailers as possible. People are not just digging and come here for a short profit, but people actually understand the, the the quality and the idea of this project that we're about to list on the on the exchange. Um, I think the com- combination of uh, combination of uh, knowledge uh, experience that we were able to obtain within the last two years, the quality of these game studios that are planning to work with us ability to work with uh, well-known key opinion leaders in this space, uh, connections with the top tier VC funds in this space. And we're working with many of them. Uh, we're in touch with Mr. Beast. We're in touch with uh, Animoca. We're in touch with you know, a whole bunch of them, right? Hashkey, et cetera. So um, if there is a need for funding, we can easily help these projects to close the rounds and not have these uh, low quality VC funds. Because as a, as a project ourselves, we had a massive trouble with the low uh, low quality uh, VCs in the past. We had 250, uh, oh, sorry, 285 VCs have invested in Cytus back in 2022, and I can honestly I can honestly say maybe 25 percent of these VCs were actually helpful. The rest were just here to uh, to dump the tokens as much as possible and as quick as possible as well. So many people made money, wow. but if you ask me, would I actually work with these VCs again? No way. I'm not even touching them anymore. Uh, it was a bad experience. And uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm really happy we've sold out all these tokens. People claim them all and they are all walked away, right? So we, we don't deal with these people anymore. We are freed finally and we're uh, able to do what we think is smart to do. So that's, a, that's why we, in, the last, in the last few months, we've seen a spike in prices and the demand for the token for about 600% is because finally those... Uh, low quality VCs are gone and people are realizing the value of the project. So we have this strong inflow of uh, users and the token holders every, every day we're getting almost 250 new token holders in the last, uh, in the last, I would say four months, we were able to get around 11,000 new token holders, which is a, an extraordinary result. So we're getting to 32,000 token holders, which is pretty big. Um, so yeah, we are working hard to work with people who understand the value of uh, quality, the value of the long-term vision, instead of just a short-term uh, speculative interest. And I mean, if you are looking for the speculation, you can go and get some meme coins and stuff. That's definitely not for sites. Yeah. Wow. Well, I think we uh, we have fortunately ran out of time. Although I feel like we could have, we could have kept going for a while. Um, so I just want to, Dan, thank you so much, uh, for, thank for you coming guys. on the show and, and being a part of it. And you guys have such a multifaceted ecosystem. I'm sure, you know, there'll be a lot more to cover in, uh, in a couple of months and, you know, maybe you, uh, make another stop by the pod and, and we can give all the updates and, and keep diving deep. So, um, just want to thank you very much for your time and, and, uh, uh, say I'm very grateful for you building in the space. Thank you. Thank you guys. It was a privilege. And, uh, we are very privileged to be a part of Neo Tokyo. Um, happy to uh, get in touch with all of those co-founders and the uh, uh, projects that are recently became a part of Neo Tokyo. Looking forward to your progress and uh, wish you a lot of success and prosperity. So all the best, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Much appreciated. And uh, thank you to the audience for tuning in. This has been the Neo Tokyo official podcast, Interlinked. We'll be back with more episodes soon. Uh, thank you, guys, and have a great rest of your day.